Now, I would not do that because I have surfed the internet. Okay? <laughs> and I've seen the light. I've seen that I can transport information at the speed of light very effectively, but never matter. I mean, I have downloaded the plans of a Ferrari. I've downloaded pictures, but never once has the Ferrari shown up in my hand. Okay? <laughs> so here's what I would do. I would take you and I'd, I'd scan you. And I take all the information that makes you up as a human being. And I take that information and transport it at the speed of light over here. And then I take some atoms I already have over here. And make another copy of you over here. Okay, that's not a transporter because you're still over there. That's really simple. I vaporized you and now you're only over here. Okay? Now, that itself isn't so simple because if you take the average human being and turn him into energy, the, it's the energy equivalent of about a, a thousand hundred megaton nuclear weapons explosion. So it's not, as we like to say nowadays, environmentally friendly. Okay? You know, but that's an engineering problem, and I'm a physicist, so I don't worry about those things. Okay. I just want to know if it's possible to do that, okay? Now, the problem is, however, I did the kind of calculation that physicists like to do, at least this physicist likes to do. It's called a naive calculation. He said, okay, how much information makes you up the average human being? Say it takes a page of information to describe each, the configuration of each atom in your body. Say, you want to know where it is, what its nearest neighbors are, the atomic configuration, et cetera, et cetera. P page of information. How much information is, would you have to digitally store to recreate a human being at the atomic level? Well, how many, uh, well, how many of you have 100 gigabyte computer now? Probably everyone. You know. When I wrote Star Trek, no one would have, okay? 100 gigabyte, well, you would need more than 100 gigabyte hard drives. Two, not enough. Turns out you'd have to stack them from here a third of the way to the center of the Milky Way galaxy. 10,000 light years worth of 100 gigabyte hard drives. And what's worse, at present information transfer rates, even without AOL, um, uh, it would take longer than the age of the universe to transport that much information. Okay? But that doesn't make the transporter impossible. It just makes it impractical. And, and, and actually, there's a world of difference, and a very important world of difference, between what's impossible and what's impractical. Because okay? the impractical will one day happen. The impossible will never happen. And just being impractical doesn't mean the transporter won't happen. But alas, and I hate to say this, I think the transporter is impossible. And the reason it's impossible is a really fancy law of physics called the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle. And it says that if I want to scan you at the atomic level, I have a problem because I can only scan you and I can find out where every atom is in your body. But then I won't know what the atoms are doing exactly. Or I can know what the atoms are doing exactly, but then I won't know exactly where they are. So I could make an approximation of you over here, but I could never make the real thing. Now, I'm not a biologist. I don't know if you just have a headache or an eye in the back of your head, but you would not be the same, the same person. Okay? Now, actually, the Star Trek writers knew that. So they created Heisenberg compensators. <laughs> and, and in fact, um, you know, whenever there's a problem with the, with the transport, it's always a, the pesky Heisenberg compensators. And, and, and actually, Michael Okuda, one of the art directors who was asked uh, by Time Magazine, you know, how do the Heisenberg compensators work? Uh, he gave a very good answer. He said, very well, thank you. And, uh, <laughs> and, um, but I want to, I wanna, look. I want to show you that even, there's a problem, even if you make the transporters, well, I want to show you the writers aren't always consistent, okay? I want to show you one of my favorite clips from Star Trek. This should have won a, an Emmy for best Canadian actor with a toupee. Um, uh, it's one of my favorite episodes called The Enemy Within. And um, in this due to a transporter malfunction, Kirk comes back, well, you'll see, as two copies of Captain Kirk. if we can get it going. Disappear. Good.
I'm gonna leave them up there. I love that. Um, now, I do, do, due to a transporter malfunction, Kirk comes back as two copies of Kirk, the good Kirk and the bad Kirk. Now, you see, you got a problem, because if you, if you make the transporter like the writer said you make the transporter, you, you got a problem, because if you, 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 know, you start out with this many atoms, you got to end up with that many atoms over here. You can't just send the good atoms and the bad atoms. But, you know, if you made a transporter the way I would make a transporter, if you could make a transporter, which you can't, then, then it would be possible because I could, you know, store that, the information. I could make as many copies as, as I want over here. In fact, you know, it, 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 there's a lot of ethical issues in science right now that we have to deal with, but they pale in comparison to the kind of issues you'd have to deal with if there were a transporter. Because, for example, if you got a cold, I could just shoot you. I'd make a backup copy, and the backup copy might be a few months old. It wouldn't have the cold. I'd just call it the backup copy, okay? <laughs> it's fascinating to think about those things, but we don't have to think about them, thank goodness, because the transporter is impossible. Now, I do want to move next, um, in fact, and, al and last almost, to, um, to something that is more realistic, and that is extraterrestrials. Now, I said they're not coming to Earth, and they're not. They haven't come to Earth. They're not doing it. But, but that doesn't mean they don't exist. And in fact, um, the, the question of extraterrestrial life is a fascinating one because, um, you know, we don't know the answer. And in fact, there'll be, there'll be a, a, a workshop here, which I think I'm going to be at in, in February on, on this question. But, uh, it, it, you know, it's not going to be easy. The problem is, even if extraterrestrials exist, we may never know about it. And, uh, and I want to just sort of give you an idea of, uh, of that. Maybe, let's see. Um, yeah, I think I'll go to the PowerPoint for a second. Let's go to here. Well, so the problem is it's a big galaxy. And even if there's, and I happen to look, we now know um, that there's about 100 billion stars in our galaxy. That's the good news, okay? And we now know that most of them probably have planets around them. I mean, astrophysicists like me would have said that before 15 years ago, because if you try and create a star in a computer, it forms something called an accretion disk, and the accretion disk fragments, and almost always solar system forms. But we don't have to worry about that theoretical modeling anymore, because we've discovered lots of planets around other stars. We now know of over 200 planets around other stars. In fact, I was just reading in the, in, uh, the other day when about a solar system now that's been discovered with five planets around the sun, some in a quote-unquote habitable zone. So there are lots of planets, and in fact, I happen to believe that, that it's quite likely that life cases. Where test cases show us if you have water, organic materials, and sunlight, okay, then life can evolve. And evolve very quick, and I'm allowed to say evolve because I'm not in Ohio so right now. But, uh, um, <laughs> But anyway, life can evolve, and on Earth, it evolved about as quickly as it could have, given the laws of physics. Within a few hundred million years of the time the Earth was formed, which is really when the laws of physics allowed life to form, because before that, the Earth was being bombarded constantly by asteroids and comets that would be vaporizing the, 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 the water in the Earth, etc. So about as soon as life could have evolved on Earth, it did. And, and all those things are ubiquitous around the, in the galaxy. There's, there's tons of starlight, tons of water when we look around, and there are even organic materials. I mean, one of the things we did learn from the hale -Bopp comet was not that there was a little spacecraft behind it, but rather we took spectra of it. You can find the basis of amino acids on that comet. Okay? So there are organic materials are all of those things. So I'm willing to believe life is, is, is everywhere. In fact, it's probably elsewhere in our solar system. The question is, is, of course, not just is life, our microbial life elsewhere, but is intelligent life elsewhere? And with that, we don't know the answer. It's a much more difficult question because we don't know if intelligence is an evolutionary imperative. We don't know if, as life evolves on different systems, it will become conscious and self-aware. 